Hello and welcome to another edition of The Conversation on New Central TV. I am Rita Omodia. On The Conversation, we get to discuss trending political issues around the African continent. And on today's edition of The Conversation, we have seen droves of Nigerian doctors leave the country for the United Kingdom in search of greener pastures. But it seems the grass isn't greener on the other side as they expected. This is because there are new reports about these doctors allegedly being exploited and made to work under unbearable conditions in the United Kingdom. This story will form part of our conversation today on the program. In a similar development, we will be taking a look at the refugee crisis in Burundi and how the humanitarian situation is impacting its neighbors. Tanzania is now calling on the international community and humanitarian agencies to help repatriate the over 120,000 Burundian refugees camping on its territory. The conversation will be right back. Now on our first topic of the conversation, one of the major issues plaguing the Nigerian health system is a shortage of personnel. It is estimated that at least 2,000 medical doctors leave Nigeria yearly and about 10,000 Nigerian trained doctors are currently practicing in the United Kingdom. Shockingly, it has been revealed that Nigerian doctors recruited by a British healthcare company are being exploited and made to work in private hospitals under conditions not allowed by the National Health Service. Reports reveal that these doctors are made to work extra hours, 24 hours a day for a week at a time on variable taxes and in some cases, some fell into depression. The British Medical Association has described the situation as shocking and some of the hospitals have denied the allegations. Now, join us for this conversation. We have Dr. Gwinga Labi, an internal medicine trainee, Northern Ireland Medical and Dental Training Agency. He joins us from Northern Ireland, UK. We also have Dr. Peter Imoesi, a research fellow, University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Uh, gentlemen and doctors, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. All right, so let's begin with Dr. Labi. First off, I, I want to believe you're a Nigerian and you're working as an internal medicine training in the UK. Can you tell us about your experience working in the UK? Dr. Labi, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so tell us about your experience working in the UK. Is that me? Yes. Okay, um, it's, it's been great. Um, started as in a non-training position, then applied to go into training. So I'm in training now for internal medicine and uh, it's been fine and well. And how have the working hours been over there? Yeah, it depends on how you came in and um, you getting the right information. I think that's where the problem is. Sometimes when people write exams from Nigeria, they get to pass their exams and start applying for jobs. Most people would get desperate and um, in an act of, as an act of desperation, people want to just take any jobs, which I think we, that's where the problem lies. So you need to be sure of what jobs you are taking read the contract very well if possible give the contract to some agencies and some organizations that could that would help you go through the contract and tell you questions to ask your employing agency before you take up the job or sign up for that contract and that's where um, some organizations such as the uh, british medical Association, comes in in this um, case all right, we'll go deeper into that. Well, let's bring Dr. Moesi into this. You're also a Nigerian. You're based in the UK. And um, from reports, we've had lots of Nigerian doctors and even African doctors uh, going into the UK for greener pastures. And Dr. Libby mentioned the issue of desperation. Now, what are some of the reasons why we have such a huge uh, flow of doctors from Nigeria and developing countries moving to the UK and even other European countries? Um, thank you for having me. So um, I think when it comes to Nigerian doctors migrating to other parts of the world, basically it's in search of greener pasture. But like the common adage says, um, we often hear that when it comes to greener pastures, it's not always green on the other side. So you may think it's green, but it's not actually very, very green the way you're seeing it from your own perspective. Um, first, um, 
people will say there are better working conditions in these countries, for instance, in the UK, um, you have better um, training and um, equipment to work with as well. At the same time, people also tie it to the remuneration. So here in the UK, um, you see majority of the doctors are paid based on their ranks and based on their um, the scale where they are in. So for, for instance, a GP in training, we earn a certain amount of money and that salary is constant. What that means is that no one is owing you your salary. So these are the kind of issues that many doctors from developing countries will look at to say, you know what, when it comes to these kind of services, I would really like to partake in those kind of um, um, services. But the thing is, like um, your guest mentioned initially, when it comes to the nitty gritty of the contract, when it comes to the nitty gritty of what it entails to do this job, they are not really paying attention to the details. They're not really dotting the I's and crossing the T's. So when you come into the workforce, you then realize what is at stake. Then you feel stuck and you feel kind of um, betrayed that you are not really informed with the right information. Whereas when it comes to these details, they were actually in the document presented, presented to you, but because of the euphoria you have at the time, you neglect all of those information. So that is why many doctors kind of migrate for better opportunities. Okay, thank you. I, I'd like to make it more personal now for Dr. Alabi. Uh, tell us one of the reasons why you had to leave Nigeria to the UK. You said you're an internal medicine trainee. What was the major reason you could have actually done your training in Nigeria? Why did you leave? <laughs> it's quite funny. Um, the the answer is um, just um, as clear as the blue sky. So I just needed to get better training and um, get more exposure. And that's why I had to leave. So one day I'll, I may come back to the country and um, use my expertise to probably develop the system, but I need to get to do um, what medicine is before coming back. So that's my decision, not necessarily money alone. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, Dr. Imwesi, you talked about contracts and all of that when you want to go to the UK. Now, what are the allowed working conditions under the National Health Service, that is the NHS? Can you take the question and get this? I said, what are the allowed working conditions under the National Health Service NHS? Um, so first, we have something called the labor, I think the labor union, the labor workforce, where a certain amount of time is allotted to each individual. So from the labor, I think the minimum hours you should work should be 52 hours a week or some, somewhere around that number. And I think for the NHS, they are somewhere around 42 hours a week. So now that is the normal length of work hours the uh, NHS doctors allot to their own staffs when it comes to the medical doctors or every other individuals involved in the sector. Now, when it does one angle to the contract itself, then the other aspect of the NHS is, of course, like Dr. Labi mentioned, you have good working conditions in the NHS itself. So the NHS is different from the report you are citing. So you have better working conditions, then you have better um, attention to details. You have um, the proper mentorship program, because once you come in, for instance, uh, if you come in as a GP in training, you have to do a series of training to get off that particular skill to then move on to a proper GP. And if you want to specialize, there are other layers of training you need to go through. So in the NHS, you have that well-structured um, process that enables people to grow and move up the ladder. Whereas when it comes to the other side of um, the abnormal recruitment of doctors from international countries, what they are really interested in is just for profit at the expense of the person who is the expert, the doctor, and at the same time, putting the patient at harm's way. I'll use the word harm's way because if you do a wrong procedure, for instance, that can lead to the death of that particular individual. And because you're in the UK, you definitely you face lots of litigation. And if you're working in the private sector, for instance, it means that you're actually engaging with high network individuals. So it means that for you to even go for the um, private um, health, um, health care in the UK, for instance, it means you're someone of substance, so you have some, um, some pounds in your pocket. So based on that, it means that the services you're going to get at that level should be at a high level because you're paying so much for it. Whereas for the NHS, it's free for everyone, but even at that, they take the welfare of their patient, the welfare of their workforce 
into cognizance when it comes to their packages and where they treat these people. So that's just the more or less difference between the NHS and the private. The NHS is a government-owned public sector kind of stuff where they look after your, um, their staff. Then they also put the, um, they put the interest of the public at heart as well. Whereas in the other side, it's just for profits. Okay, now between private and public, Dr. Alabi, uh, when this report came out of uh, uh, the alarming rate at which doctors are working abroad and the long hours they have to work, the British Medical Association described the situation under which these doctors work for four nights consecutively, among other treatments, as shocking. Now, Dr. Moisey mentioned this private and the public uh, sector. What do you make of the report or the reply by the British Medical Association? I mean, they seem to be yeah. not aware of what's going on. Okay, I, I think um, I was at the ARM of the BMA. Um, I think in, we had it in June when um, one of the motions that was passed was for the BMA executive to look into the working hours of our colleague in the private sector. And as um, the, my other colleague has said, um, the maximum you can work is technically 48 hours if you are a doctor in the NHS per week. And if you must do more than that, there is a document that you'll be made to sign. So at, the normal would usually be 40 hours. And then if you are doing in excess in the NHS, you should not do more than 48 hours averagely over six months. So that regulation, that law is in the labor law and it has to be obeyed. And so many agencies look into that to be sure that um, doctors are not cheated. But that doesn't occur in the uh, private um, sector. So when the BMA um, investigated that, along with, uh, I think, um, Doctors Association UK, that as you came up, we would have some of our colleagues in that field, and it's something that poses danger to patient safety. And that was why the alarm had to be raised. I need to cast our mind back to an event that occurred, I think, in between 10, 2010 and 2012, where um, a foundation year doctor just finished his night and um, was going home. Probably he felt uh, um, very tired and um, slept off behind the wheel, and um, he had an accident and died. So that law, that incident made so many revolutions in the hours doctors are allowed to walk over here. And that was why if you are on night or if you can't work more than 12 hours at a stretch, that's it's a law. Aside doing more, not doing more than 48 hours in a week, you cannot work more than 12 hours in a stretch. Once you've worked 12 hours in a stretch, you must rest for the next 12 hours. It's a law and has to be obeyed. Another thing is if you are on continuous night, you can't do more than four nights at a stretch. You must get at least three days break. So it's part of the law and it has to be obeyed. So those are some of the things that um, our colleagues need to know and they need to be aware of such that you won't be cheated in any contract you have signed. It's unthinkable to work 16 hours at stretch without putting patients at a risk. Okay, Dr. Alabi, uh, looking at the concerns of working for long hours uh, and the risk that I put on the patients and even the doctor, you talk about the British Medical Association being aware of the situation on ground. I, I wonder who takes care of the welfare of the doctors, Nigerian doctors, African doctors, and do you see this as a form of racism or it's just uh, private companies going after their profits alone? I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't play, play the racist card yet, but it's just that... Um, most people who would have to come over here would require a certificate of sponsorship. And you know, citizens here do not need that to work. However, if you are coming from outside, you have to get that sponsorship. So that was, that's where I think the private agencies come in. And when they recruit our members, even if you have come in and you didn't do those unholy hours, you can always reach out. The British Medical Association is not only for their members. So they cater for non-members also, although I encourage all doctors to be a member of the BMA and be aware of what event is ongoing there. I sit on the Junior Doctors Committee Council here in Northern Ireland, just for me to be aware of what the laws are around and not feel 
or get cheated. And if you are not aware of what the law is or what regulation and what um, privileges you have, I think you may not know how to fight for your rights. So I would always encourage my colleague to be a member. And um, I wouldn't say it's just African doctors that um, put in this uh, mess. I would just say it's most times probably because one, one is very desperate to get a job after spending so much to write the exam and passing and being on the GMC register. But in, in addition to that, I will encourage people, when you come in, know the law of the land, be aware of um, um, organizations that can help you fight your cause and also get um, yourself sorted and be aware of the system. Because it's very important you know. Okay, Dr. Moise, let's look at the NES Healthcare, which specializes in employing doctors from overseas, many from Nigeria, and using them as resident medical officers. Now, the NES Healthcare has been found guilty of this on healthy contracts that put doctors in very uncomfortable working conditions. What more can you tell us about the NES? Um, so, I think if you're a trained medical doctor, it means you've spent seven years within your training in Nigeria. And you should be able to read and write clearly. So if, for instance, you present me a document, which is a contract, and it says, I'm going to work 16 hours a day, and I'm going to work that for seven days, and every single time I decide to say, well, I'm staying off work, I'm going to get some certain deduction, I think is a two-way approach here. First is greed on both sides. One, the so-called employer is trying to ex um, exploit these individuals. On the other side of, this, of, of, of the fence, this individual is looking at a platform where, oh, if I get a visa sponsorship, well, that is a, a part to what I'm looking for in the, in the midst of all of these things. Neglecting the fact that you are not a robot, you're a human being, and you don't have the capacity to work for 16 hours every single day. So if you were signing a contract, you knew exactly what you were getting into. So you coming in here and, well, the knees have broken the law that's established because from WHO, you, uh, we are not allowed to go to developing countries to actively recruit doctors. So there's a breach there when it comes to the law. Then also, in fact, I think in the, in the UK, you're not allowed to go to Nigeria. I think Nigeria is a red flag based on that BBC report that you're not allowed to recruit actively. So those guys have broken the law on their own end. But you signing the contract, you were a little bit greedy because you saw what the terms and conditions were. Because if you go to the law court, for instance, they're going to present these documents. And the first question you will be asked is, did you append your signature on this particular document? If the answer is yes, it means you accepted to the terms and conditions. So at this point, you not really should be complaining. What you should do if you don't like the terms and conditions is to resign from the job and look for better options. And to say finally is this, when you want to go out for job opportunities anywhere in the world, whether in Ghana, Nigeria, coming to the UK or to the US, wherever you're going to, desperation should be out of the window. First and foremost, look at the working conditions. Are you able to meet the demands they are asking? Do you have the requisite skills to perform that job effectively? Will the remuneration be comparable to the living standard in that country? So I'll give you an example, for instance. Right now, we know that when it comes to the tax in the UK, average income tax sits at 20%. So whatever you're earning, 20% is taken off automatically. On top of that, you have something called the National Insurance Number Tax, which is the NI. That is about 13.25%. So when you add 13.25% to 20%, that is about 33.25% automatically deducted from your so-called earning. So by default, you have 70% standing for you. In that 70%, of course, you are a high-skilled worker, so you're going to be paying the council tax. Mm. So if you're living in London, for instance, you're going to pay more on your council tax, depending on the brand of house you're living. So about... 2 to 3% is off that your salary again. At the end of the day, your take home um, package may not be able to sustain you in a place like London or in England. Mm. So you then put all of these things into context to say, you know what, if I'm to take this job, 
Stop converting what you're going to earn in pounds to naira. You're not going to be spending in naira. You're going to be spending in pounds. So because you're spending in pounds, your living standard should be at the same par with your final package that comes into your bank account, not what you see on the advert by saying, oh, you're going to earn 35,000 pounds per annum, blah, blah, blah. Once you earn all of that, divide by 12, it makes good sense. But once the tax comes in, everything goes out of the window. And that is where the education comes in. If you're a trained doctor, you should have the requisite skills of critical thinking and analysis to be able to dissect, analyze a document and a contract to say, do I go for this or should I go for better options? The NHS is a better option. If you're trying to use the back door, these are the sort of issues you're going to encounter going forward. Those are very serious issues. And I'm going to stay with this breach of law because just like you rightly said, uh, Dr. Chalabi, Nigeria and among some other African countries have been placed under a red list, which is, as uh, uh, Dr. Moise said, a no-go destination for British medical recruiters. Now, the question is, why are there still reports of professional and linguistic assessment board tests set up by the General Medical Council in London? If it's supposed, if Nigeria is a red list, I mean, wouldn't you consider it as illegal? I wouldn't say it's illegal because um, even the MDCN, if they have the wherewithal, they can also set exam centers in different parts of the world. However, you can get um, qualified in to practice in any country, but that doesn't mean that um, you get actively uh, active recruitment from um, that country. I I'll give an instance. Um, the, the rate at which doctors move is even lower than the way the rate at which the nurses move. So that's something um, we are not even looking at at all. So um, if an exam has been set up in a country and um, people write exams, get to pass, and you apply on your home to those agencies, that's an evidence that, OK, they are not probably active, act, actively recruiting. It is you that showed interest in coming to their country to work. We should realize that um, brain drain is not only affecting Nigeria, it's affecting so many African countries and even some Western countries. People are even leaving UK for other parts of the world, Canada, Australia, and the likes. And the fact that the right, it's not only PLAB that is written in Nigeria, uh, the USMLE also is written in Africa. I think if you are writing at USMLE, you probably go to Ghana, get the exams written, and still you apply to the country, to US to, to, to practice there. So it's, some would say it's not really active recruitment, and there is a difficult need us here for the government to probably stop this brain drain. I think it will be very difficult, and but having to actively recruit is what is illegal and that's what the who has stated that it is immoral for developed countries to actively recruit from nations who have a very poor health indices okay now a last question dr Moise here looking at the what the world health organization said now it puts doctor patient ratio at one to six hundred that is the standard but in Nigeria, we have doctors to patients ratio of about 1 to 10,000, and that falls below the global recommendation. What effect does this have on the modern African countries? I mean, if we have all the, all the doctors living in African countries and going for greener pastures, what effect will it have on African countries? Uh, it means that you're going to lose your best brains to other parts of the world. It means that when it comes to the health care standard and delivery, it's going to drop below what it is currently. It also means that in the near future, you're not going to have mentors to mentor the upcoming ones. So for instance, if you have someone who has been in the Nigerian healthcare system for say 30 years, that individual has experience enough to mentor upcoming medical doctors. If that person leaves because of being in search of greener pasture, it means that once you have new persons coming on board, they won't really have someone with the required skills and experience to put them through. So that is what you're going to experience in the country. You're also going to experience a drop in your average life expectancy because all of these things, they tie to the healthcare system delivery. So if you have a very functional healthcare system, you have competent people at the helms of affairs, you have the right numbers in these areas of specialty and expertise, it means that your citizens will benefit effectively. 
Now, once they benefit from these high skilled delivery healthcare um, services, it means that their functionality when it comes to productivity will be up there because it's only a wealthy mind, a healthy mind that can actually work excellently well in, in, in any form of um, organization. So if you have a sick nation, it means that your productivity when it comes to your economy is going to be grounded. So there's a lot of issues tied to the well-being of citizens. There's a lot of issues tied to the well-being of medical doctors or medical personnel or science in general. But once we have this um, brain drain ongoing consistently in this cadre of people in the middle class, in the medical um, um, terrain, it means that going forward, Nigeria will just be a production ground. So you're going to produce your doctors. At the end of graduation, they relocate. You produce at a very cheap rate. At the end of graduation, they relocate. Many universities in the UK, to become a medical student in year one, you pay as high as 50,000 pounds mm -hmm. a year. So you, you, you see how you train your doctors effectively yeah. in Nigeria when it comes to the understanding of the concept of medicine mm -hmm. at a very low rate. Then you are exporting those guys, or those guys are just living without any element of um, remuneration in the country. So I think the government should sit tight to right. put the system in order, give them the best working environment and services, and let's put our country back on track. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Emersi. We'll continue to have conversations of this brain drain and how to make the situation better on the African continent. Thank you so much, Dr. Bengalabi and Dr. Peter Emersi, for joining us on this conversation.